first step is to like check your symptoms, ask your doctor if you know, if they know anything about it, because some doctors will be like, uh, yeah, it's not a big deal. Well, it is when it affects your methylation of the process of your body. <laughs> so um, finding somebody like myself that is um, educated in this realm of um, functionality in the body and how that impacts us is important. But even some functional practitioners don't look at food. And that's my focus as a functional nutritionist is to look at food as your medicine, right? Food be thy medicine is what Hippocrates said. Hello and welcome to the Evolving with Jessica podcast. My name is Jessica. I am an integrative nutrition health coach, a holistic skin healing guide, and certified life coach. In this podcast, we cover topics such as holistic health and wellness, nutrition, and spirituality. If you enjoy or gain any insight, please leave a review. This makes the show more searchable, which helps others find the information too. My guest today specializes in helping women who are struggling with MTHFR, and if you clicked on this episode, chances are you or someone close to you does. However, Rhiannon holds a wealth of health knowledge that I think anyone listening will be able to take away from. Rhiannon is a certified functional nutrition counselor board certified health coach with the American Association of Natural Wellness Coaches and a board certified member of the American Association of Drugless Practitioners. She began her journey in functional nutrition after struggling to maintain her chronically ill child's health with antibiotics. Exhausted and overwhelmed, she delved into research eventually finding her passion and supporting others on the path to optimal health and wellness. With a focus on individuals with MTHFR, Rhiannon provides personalized support and guidance to help clients optimize their wellness in just 90 days without spending hours Googling. Enjoy this episode. So you help women with MTHFR optimize their wellness in 90 days with their unique genetic blueprint. First of all, I would love to know what is MTHFR? So MTHFR stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, and it is a gene and also an enzyme in the body. And when people are missing that, um, genes specifically, they have trouble converting different things in their body. So it can show up with issues with methylation, which is tied to several hundred different processes in the body. And the most common things that I work with are people with like ADHD, brain fog, fatigue, uh, mostly women, because we're the ones (laughs) stressing our bodies out. And so those things are showing up more prevalently. Not that men don't deal with things too, but us women are more like in tune with our level of discomfort. (laughs) Yes, agreed. I actually, I've heard of these letters put together in this order, but I'm not too familiar with it overall. So I'm glad that we're having this conversation, but I went to research it a little bit just to have an idea. And the question that was coming up for me is how does someone know that it's this versus something else? Like, how do you know that I'm guessing maybe that's where the genetic blueprint comes in? Yeah, so a lot of people have been led to MTHFR based on their symptoms. So for example, women with infertility or pregnancy loss, more and more places now are actually testing for MTHFR, but they're still unfortunately not necessarily giving the appropriate information that they should be giving them. Um, So for example, those of us with MTHFR should not have folic acid because we can't convert that into a usable form. So essentially it just kind of jams up the cogs of the wheel, so to speak. And um, it doesn't work effectively, so we we can't process it. So telling people, especially with infertility, that are already struggling with that, that they need something that's not usable is a little bit idiotic. (laughs) But um, Mm -hmm. in that sense, it's generally the symptoms that bring people here. Um, And then they learn about, you know, other nutritional deficiencies and all that. But 
The problem with that is most people that are getting the testing don't have the next step. They don't know what to do. And so that's where that blueprint comes in. So we can create a plan for them and a path of like, here's the foods to eat. Here's the supplements you should take. Here's the lifestyle changes you need to make. So they actually have a clear step of what to do with that information. Okay. So step one is kind of evaluate your symptoms, diagnose yourself, or preferably probably go to a naturopath. Yeah, so I'm a functional practitioner, and so I do that testing through um, my lab partner, and that testing is, again, different. So most of the things, like some people do like 23andMe or GeneSide or whatnot, but then, again, they don't have those next steps. So it's like, I know what I have, but I don't know what to do with it, but it's not just MTHFR. I want people to know that MTHFR could be a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the whole puzzle. And so with the testing that I offer... It gives 135 different genes so we can look at a wider variety of like how these things are interplaying together and are they potentially causing other issues or are there other genes that have an impact on how they're feeling overall. So first step is to like check your symptoms, ask your doctor if you know if they know anything about it, because some doctors will be like, uh, yeah, it's not a big deal. Well, it is when it affects your methylation of the process of your body. <laughs> so um, finding somebody like myself that is um, educated in this realm of um, functionality in the body and how that impacts us is important. But even some functional practitioners don't look at food. And that's my focus as a functional nutritionist is to look at food as your medicine, right? Food be thy medicine is what Hippocrates said. So um yeah, finding somebody that's going to help you on that journey is essential. 100% going back to how you just mentioned, they might act like it's not a big deal. Like many doctors, depending on the type of doctor, they do brush off these symptoms because they're so common, which doesn't yep. mean they're normal, but yes, they're very common. Yeah. And it's kind of scary how these things are brushed off because if they are, then they do pile up and they lead to these bigger things. Uh, I'm really interested though. Okay. So if you have the genetic blueprint done and then you can see for sure that you have this, which is just so cool. And because that's what people want, right? When they have these different symptoms, they want to know, they want an answer. Like, what is wrong with me? What do I have? And so that's so important. So then they can find out for sure. Okay. Now I have this. And now I can look at these different pillars that you're talking about, like diet which I would love to start there. Um, I can only speak to, speak to this a little bit because you know I had my own health issues and I decided to go the holistic route and diet was the first place I looked. So what would be just like generally speaking, like a typical diet or meal that would be good for someone trying to heal themselves with this? So the first thing that you wanna look at is your gut health because you could be doing all the things right but if your gut's not absorbing the things you're still gonna have problems mm -hmm. and a lot of times people don't think about it like oh i eat healthy and everyone's definition of healthy eating is vastly different <laughs> and so i will ask people tell me what that looks like or i'll start having them do their food journaling and i'm like this is not a healthy diet at all i don't know what university you live in but that is not healthy um so we really kind of look at like, what does your gut health look like? Do we have any issues with histamine intolerance potentially? And what does that look like for people? How does that show up and what you're eating every day? Like, is it a runny nose? Are you getting migraines on a regular basis? Do you have bloating, upset stomach? Like, what does that look like for you? So we investigate that and really start to focus on like what we're eating, when we're eating, and the, the signs that your body could be giving you is like a check engine light to look at and then start to either remove or replace foods um, and go through kind of the 4R for for protocol if that's something that we deem necessary. Okay, great. So it depends kind of on what the specific symptoms are for each person, yeah. what you would have them eating. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there are obvious things like Everybody with MTH fire needs cruciferous vegetables, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, I do recommend now also everybody that has MTHFR suspects that they have MTHFR have broccoli sprouts. And the reason for that is because there's a 
something in it that helps your body open up specific pathways for like detoxing and, and methylation and things like that. So um, it's a superfood essentially, but most people don't eat broccoli sprouts on a regular basis. And so that's something I'm like, let's start this off and supplement and you should start to see signs and symptoms of like reduced brain fog and things like that um, pretty quickly when your body's able to actually utilize what it has. Mm -hmm. uh, broccoli sprouts. So great. I only brought them in about a year ago, but mm -hmm. I, I didn't know about them either. And I've been on my health journey for about six years. So yep. putting them in a salad or in a smoothie, there's so many ways you can use them, but I wonder what is it about broccoli sprouts versus actual broccoli? Do you know? The sulforaphane in them okay. um it's going to be a higher like concentration and so like when you cook your food your nutrients deplete right and the right. longer it sits the less nutrients it has mm -hmm. so getting those sprouts you're going to have that fresh and like ready to go so you can get it in powdered form you can just eat broccoli sprouts like you are now which is great mm -hmm. um but not everybody likes them. So, you know, I always ask people, here's your options. Are you going to actually read broccoli sprouts and broccoli, or do you want to supplement? <laughs> that's right. Well, that's yeah. great that you even give them that option knowing, yeah. you know, some people aren't going to take this step to some, for some people, they're going from a standard American diet or like fast food diet to broccoli sprouts. That is a pretty big step. Yeah, absolutely. And think about how much sugar is in our foods because everything is processed, right? And so people are likely addicted to sugar too. Um, yeah. They're likely having a lot of dairy and um, gluten, which are highly inflammatory as well. So, you know, I take every single person on a case by case basis and just go, where are you at? And like, what's our next step while we're waiting for your results to come back? Right, right. Okay. So I'm curious, you mentioned gluten and dairy. I also recommend usually to everyone to eliminate those. What do you think about raw dairy? So I've heard mixed reviews on raw dairy, and I think it's more so in the States that it's not as still great, but that's a lot of food yeah. <laughs> in general. I mean, we could go abroad and have healthy living without even questioning it. And that's why a lot of people do travel, have dairy and gluten without any issues while yeah. they're traveling overseas. So, you know, it comes down to how things are are processed or raised. Um, is it farm fresh? Is it free range? Is it grass fed? Is it like all of those things, right? And so I still keep away from dairy in all aspects, even uh, goat dairy, because some people are just super sensitive to that and it's still super inflammatory for them. So, you know, if we remove or replace and we can go through that process and find things and understand like, this is what your body's liking, this is what it's not, then mm -hmm. we can maybe slowly reintroduce things to them. But likely they're like, I don't even want to change it because I just feel better and I'm just going to stick with this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes sense. I want to talk about more to the toxins. So I saw that you talk about different toxins that may come with food. So what are those? Where do they come from? How do we avoid them? This is kind of a big topic. So um, let's maybe just stay on the food part when it comes to toxins. Yeah. And so what are some common toxins that we find in our food and what, what should we do to avoid them? So the biggest, the biggest thing with food in general and toxins is avoiding anything that's like processed. So overly processed foods. So shopping the perimeter of the store is always going to be the best bet for you, especially when you're wanting to change your diet and you'll realize how much of your diet is actually chemically engineered. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so avoiding things that are genetically modified, also really big, um, because if you think about it, a lot of times those foods are modified to destroy the gut of the bug that's eating it so what do you think it's going to do to you if you eat it mm, yeah right yeah. and so we talk about gut health as being so important and thinking about like what are we consuming that's actually contributing to causing issues with our gut health right. so that's the big thing there's avoiding bioengineered or genetically modified foods um, mm -hmm. eating organic as often as you can so important and it's at least the clean 15 and the dirty dozen are monitored. And those can be checked every single year to see what's on the list on the EWG website. But mm -hmm. the clean 15 are the ones that are, have lower amounts of like chemicals and pesticides and things. Mm -hmm. um, but even organic foods now just don't nutritionally have the foundation, if you will, that food did 50 years ago because our soils depleted and things are raised differently. We've got pollution in the air and all these things. And so if you can do that, that's a huge thing. And then also look at the water that you're drinking and cooking with, right? So 
Think yeah. about like Mexico, for example. I lived in Mexico for six months. We just recently got back and we couldn't cook with our water there, right? Like, but then you come back here and you've got fluoride, which is a neurotoxin in our water. And it's like, okay, well, it's cleaner, but now it's full of chemicals. <laughs> right. Right. So water filtration is important with not only hydration, but also your food too. So very, very important. I think about that when I'm just steaming vegetables, like there's times where I'll, you know, use my filtered or like my water that I buy to drink. And mm -hmm. then there's times where I just, I don't know if it's laziness or what, but I will use the water from the sink. And then it's in my mind thinking like, what am I doing? Like I'm steaming my vegetables and these chemicals are now in that. Yep. So I don't know but where to draw the line really. And then there's the, um, the point with the spraying of the plants. So you want to choose organic. I always buy organic. So, but even with apples and cucumbers, I will wash them and I'll peel them. Yeah. Now you can tell me your opinion if you think that's going to extremes. No, I don't think it's extreme at all. And I think right now people need to be educated on that appeal that's being sprayed on organic food. Uh, right. Because that is still something that is a chemical, even if they say it's okay and it's biodegradable and it's this and that, eh, I don't trust it. There's a lot of things coming out that's not good about it right now. And mm. you can find anything with the appeal sticker on it. Don't Even if it's organic, I would avoid it. And so that's just mm. something to be aware of too. But peeling it, I definitely think is fine. Washing your fruit, um, you know, you can do those, um, what are they called? Not an ionizer, can't even think of the word right now. Um, but they help to do vibration and stuff to like clean your food. It's like an oxidizer or something like that. I personally just use filtered water, uh, vinegar, white distilled vinegar and baking soda for 20 minutes with my fruit. And that's how I wash it. So even organic, <laughs> even yeah. organic. Yeah. Because sometimes too, I've noticed recently, actually I've gotten berries that were marked like in the organic section. But then when you look at the skew, I believe it needs to start with a nine or a three and yeah. they don't and the berries are awfully big like abnormally strangely big and yeah. so the questioning are these even organic when they're in an organic box so it's like can you even trust that anymore right and it's hard because it's like everybody should just go back to raising their own crops and eating their own food and how much yeah. cheaper would that be for everybody right um we're looking at getting like a hydroponic like vertical planter thing because yeah. for homeschooling to my children they can use that but I mean just for common sense food right now because the cost of food mm -hmm. is just so expensive for a good quality you know organic yeah. food sure. <laughs> um so your children I did read that your daughter and maybe this is I would love to hear your story and how you got involved in this work and I have a yeah. feeling this might have to do with it um your daughter was taking antibiotics yeah. So she was actually born missing part of her immune system and we didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, so at three months old, she had bacterial pneumonia and she wasn't in like a care facility. Like we had a babysitter come in and we watched, like he watched her and that was that. So it's just like him and her all day long. And, and so we were so confused of like, why she had bacterial pneumonia, which is like the worst kind of pneumonia you can have at three months old. Wow. And at about two weeks old, we started noticing like some digestion issues and reflux she was diagnosed with and then MSPI and it was just like a thing after a thing after a thing and then she started getting upper respiratory infections after that um, pneumonia for about two weeks at a time every four to six weeks cyclical and it would get to the point where I just call the pediatrician's office and be like what's our next antibiotic and then they started putting her on a preventative to prevent it and that ended up frying her gut and she ended up with a head to toe yeast infection. And um, that's when I was like, this is not working. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is not working. Yeah. yeah, we're killing her gut at this point. Like there needs to be something different we're doing. It needs to be a better way. And at that point I was already using essential oils. I was already using herbs. Like I was already on that path, mm -hmm. but that was the thing that was just like, okay, well, she's got this respiratory infection. And, and then I moved to Kansas city and that's where that happened. And they were like, nope, we're not this is before I had the issue with the um, yeast infection for her, but they were like, we're not giving her an antibiotic. It's a viral infection. I'm like, I understand that. But per the IDF website, this is what they say right now, what she should do. And this is her treatment protocol. And they like fought me over it. Well, and then we found a new pediatrician and we went a whole different route and did all that. Now she's 
healthier than she's ever been. Even got COVID last year and puked for 24 hours and that was it. Like, I was so surprised. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you do talk about the gut and the microbiome and this is so relatable. I'm sure your daughter's, I mean, that's insane. I could not imagine dealing with all of that as, I mean, I'm not a mother, but I have nieces and nephews and Mm -hmm. at two weeks or three months, like having these different issues. Wow. That must've been extremely stressful and hard on you. Um, I, I imagine that that's like, you've done a lot of learning since then. And as far as the ins and outs of health and I'm sure she's, she's good now, I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. Healthier than she's ever been. Like, it's like I said, when she got COVID, I was, I was scared, you know, like, yeah. and I flat out told her, I'm like, I don't know what this could do to you. This could kill you for all we know. Like we need right. to be smart with what we're doing right now. And um, yeah, she did better than I did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Yep. So I, I experienced gut issues as well from antibiotics. So I can relate, although mine was more in my twenties and mm. It was, I just, I didn't know that they did that. I didn't know the antibiotics kill all of your microbiome. Um, I don't know if that's the correct term, but basically I was taking z packs like they were Tylenol and it didn't take long from doing that until, um, yeah, I just, I had to learn how to repopulate my and heal my gut, which where would be a good place? Because I know a lot of people listening to this probably need help with their gut as well and healing their gut. How would you suggest or recommend building back up that good bacteria? So butyrate's a good way um, to start working on your gut health. And there's lots of different like supplements, L-glutamine that you can take to help with the integrity of the gut. But when it comes to like populating the gut, it, really, in my opinion, there's a lot of factors that come to play with that. So for one, like, let's say, for example, you had a histamine intolerance and we didn't know, or mast cell activation syndrome, and you didn't know, right? I could Mm -hmm. be telling you take one type of supplement and it could be exacerbating your mast cell activation. So there's a lot of things that come to play with that. And that's why everything that I do is a case by case basis, because I want to be able to say, like, I recommend this, you know, I, this is what I would suggest doing um, because X, Y, and Z, you know, and getting to know a person and their body on how it functions and how it works is important because we're all different, similar, but different in that Mm. regard. And stool samples are a great way to, to be able to determine exactly what you're dealing with, exactly what you've got. Um, which I generally like ask people, like, have you done anything like that before? And people are like, why would I do that? (laughs) (laughs) Well, we need to know what's in there, you know? Um, And so that's a great place to start if your practitioner will order that. If not, you know, that's something I, with the lab that I partner with, I can order too. Mm. Yeah, I've done that. (laughs) The stool sample, the food intolerance test, the endoscopy, all the tests. Yeah, I mean- one other thing though you mentioned histamine intolerance I feel like I have had that before and another person um who talks about this I've heard Tom Bilyeu mention several times that he has a histamine intolerance and that he takes a um what are they called a blocker basically every day and he admits that he is not he's not naive to the fact that long-term wise, that this is probably going to yield some type of result that is undesirable. However, what else can you do if you have a histamine intolerance? I mean, that would, what kind of tests could you get or how would you resolve that without a blocker? So low histamine diets are an easy way to be able to do that. Um, So avoiding things that are histamine liberators, um, such as like egg whites. So a lot of people eat eggs for breakfast and egg whites don't always affect everybody, but they could be a liberator, meaning it could be like exacerbating the issue, right? And it lets them out and it's like gives them free range to come out and play, which you don't want to have. But Mm -hmm. histamine is really, for those that aren't aware, it's essentially like if you have allergies, right? Um, And you're going to have a runny nose, you're going to have the itchy, you're going to have the sneezing, that's all histamine. 
And so when you have a histamine intolerance, your food will respond in your body the same way. And Mm -hmm. it can be partially because of a leaky gut. It can be because those imbalances, or it could be just overall that you have a a mast cell issue as well. And so those are all things to look into, but mast cell is obviously more severe, like you have flushing and, um, you know, all sorts of different things. It's tied to your hormones and and those things as well. But um, yeah, histamine is, is a, tricky thing for people because they're like, oh, I want to eat my tomatoes and I love avocados and, you know, all the foods Mm -hmm. that you shouldn't be eating if you have a histamine intolerance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can take those, but it's really important. And I encourage my clients to take those while they're doing their, their low histamine um, diet. So then that way they can get, you know, comfortable, feel good in their body and see what that looks like. And then if they need to take that out and can want to continue with that low histamine diet, awesome. But again, every single person's situation is so different how their body responds. So I never, I'm just going to be like, this is what I see for everybody. This is like just some right. different ideas. Right. Right. So. Right. So you don't, you, you do recommend taking the histamine blockers. If you have a histamine intolerance while you eat a low histamine diet, and then eventually tapering off of the blockers. And then over time, the histamine intolerance should subside. It should. And again, it's going to be different for every person. Um, Some people will still have things that are triggering histamine for whatever reason. Um, You know, I have worked with clients that have had allergies for years and years and years and on daily Zyrtec. And then we uncover that they have histamine issues and, and those types of things. And so they're able then to go, oh, okay, well, maybe I don't need that. Let's try this. And then that kind of acts as their like Zyrtec for the, for each day, you know, to kind of make sure that they stay in check with those things. Um, but yeah, once you get that under balance, there's going to be ebbs and flows with hormones and things like that, essentially, especially with mast cell type of things. Um, but yeah, and it doesn't have to be a long time. You can do 30 days. You can see a difference with your histamine issues within a week or two. It just depends on how severe it is, what your food's like, what your body shape is in as far as like, you know, is your gut health good? All of that. Right, right. Now, are hormones another area that you look at? So I can test hormones. I don't specifically say, hey, let's go test them now. I give that option, but we start to look at like your cycle, right? So for a client specifically, um, she came in, she had flushing, she had nausea, she had migraines. um, She was on all sorts of medications for years, antidepressants, Zyrtex, like all the things, right? Blood pressure medication. Nobody could ever figure out what's going on with her. It was just medication, medication, medication. And she was miserable. She's like, I'm gaining weight. I am tired of living like this. I have brain fog. It is awful. And so I was like, totally understand. Let's figure out what's going on in there. Right. And so when we started to peel back the things, we uncovered the fact that like her cycle, she would have, you know, extreme pain or, you know, different things. She would know her period was coming. Well, we started working with her, got the histamine, you know, in check. Then, um, her period just kind of came and she didn't have any issues with that. And she was like, huh, this is so interesting. And yeah. how it's tied with the respiratory issues as well, because there's a lot of histamine in your lungs and surrounding areas and same with your uterus. And so um, it's very interesting to see those things, but it, you can absolutely do testing. And I recommend a lot, you know, testing if that's needed for the person, but if we can kind of manage it and figure it out, get to know your body, get comfortable with it. Like, you know, that's the thing is, Something could tell you on a lab test one thing, but your body's going to tell you more than anything where you're sitting. Like if you feel terrible, then let's let's go investigate that further. If this is not working, let's go investigate that further. Mm-hmm. But if we can manage that and kind of get that in a spot where you're comfortable with that, there's really, in my opinion, no need unless the person feels that that's a desire of theirs. Gosh, the world needs more practitioners like you (laughs) that sees that, you know, everything is connected and actually cares and looks at each individual area and, you know, has you listening to your body instead of just relying on a test because tests can be inaccurate too, from my understanding, because they're taking that, you know, one blimp in time and it could change from one moment to the next. Absolutely. Especially with your hormone ranges, right? Like, unless you do like a full, you know, let's say 30 days with your full cycle, those are going to change every day, your food, your stress level, your sleep, all of that plays such a huge factor in everything working and what you're eating on a daily basis. Like 
all of that, like literally everything that you do moment to moment, day by day is going to swing you in one way or another. And so if you can really just get comfortable with listening to your body, that's where people, I feel like go wrong is they just don't take the time to get to know themselves at a cellular and molecular level to listen and really just understand. So why do you think that is? We're too busy. We're too busy to sit down and make that a priority. We're not taught how to do that or what that looks like. We're disconnected from ourselves because we're living this chaotic life of go, 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 do, 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 do all the time. And productivity and people feel like rest is not valuable when rest is more valuable, in my opinion, than the doing all the time. So in our house, we do potato days. At least one day a week, I am laying on the couch. We don't do anything. We are mm-hmm. lay in bed, read a book, scroll on social media, whatever I'm doing to just decompress, to not do it. And I am so much more alive that next day. I get so much more done because I just had that day for my body to sit and relax and recuperate. I love that idea. Potato mm-hmm. days. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That's yeah. I, I definitely need to adopt that practice. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's great. Everybody needs it. Yeah, definitely. And like in today's world, between everything you're mentioning, it's just like we are constantly taught and it's glamorized and encouraged for us to be turned on all the time. And yep. especially to the point where it's like our sleep is affected. It's like mm-hmm. we're not getting enough. And when we do, we're not actually getting the deep sleep, the quality sleep that we need to function properly, forget optimally. Yeah. And yeah. It's just. Well, sleep has a huge factor in detoxing. And if you're not getting enough sleep and you already have issues with detoxing with MTHFR, like sleep is so important. And those of us with MTHFR and ADHD, sleep is an issue for those people often because mm-hmm. they can't turn their brain off. It's go, go, go. I got to do the thing, make another list, thinking about this. Like So that already in itself can be an issue, but you know, with the right supplements and the right diet that can be managed as well. Right. Yes. Um, another thing too, is like, and I am guilty of this is electronics and same room that we sleep. And it's it's like, how many of these things do we know, but we don't actually do. So it's like, why, where is that disconnect? What will take us from like knowing and actually doing it's so funny you say that because I, if my kids get so sick of me saying this, but I'm like, knowing and doing is two different things. And <laughs> I'm guilty just like anybody else. But my motto in the last few years has become love yourself first. Mm. And I'm going to get that tattooed at some point. But it's really about like loving yourself more than you can love other people and loving yourself and honoring yourself and respecting your own boundaries for things. So whether that be like, I am not looking at my phone till nine o'clock, or I am reading every night before bed, or I am going to meditate for an hour, at least one point a day or 10 minutes or whatever that looks like. I'm going to stretch and I'm going to go see friends. I'm Mm -hmm. going to fill my cup first because when my cup is full, then I can serve other people. And that can be something as small for those people that are like, what does that look like? Because people think self-care is going, getting massages and facials and your hair done. And Mm -hmm. I am here to tell you, that's not it. Self-care is honoring yourself by brushing your teeth in the morning, by shaving your legs once a week, by making sure your hair gets washed. Those little acts of love for yourself are the self-care. And Mm -hmm. it's so glamorized. You have to go spend money, go buy Starbucks, go do the things, go, you know, do all these. It's not. And if you can just get really simple with your self-care routine, I know as a busy mom, with ADHD, I'm like, what was the last time I washed my hair? Oh, it looks kind of gross. Probably should do that today. No more dry shampoo, right? But if I can put that in and go, Sundays and Wednesdays are my hair days, then I know Sundays and Wednesdays that that's the day that I do that. And that's my self-care day. When's your cleaning day? Fridays. You know, all these things are little acts of love for yourself. And that's where I feel like the knowing and the doing come in because you're more self-aware with loving yourself and that that is an act of self-love in itself. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love everything you're saying. And it sounds like even scheduling it in so that you yeah. know what's happening so that like, it's just, it's another thing on your list, but it's for you. It's not like yep. something to accomplish. It's something just to feed your soul. Yep. hundred percent. 
Yep. Every single day I've got like my quiet time is on there and I know what I'm doing in my quiet time. My bedtime is on there. Do I always follow it? No. Are there days that things get out of whack? Yes. But I'm human too. And I would encourage you to like, if you're going to make a new habit, habit stacking is huge. So if you're going to start a new morning routine, then do one thing. And then that once you got that one done, do the next thing and you just add on to it. And then that's your morning routine. And then that's just how you function and you operate differently. And it's a conscious decision to make that change. But once you do, it's so worth it. Yes, yes. And oh my gosh, I feel like, I mean, most of what I do is habit stacking. And I forget the book that I read that in, but it's maybe Atomic Habits. Yeah, he does it in there too. I've done it for years, but I was like, oh yeah, it's good to see somebody else do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, it's because we're we're operating on autopilot. It's something yep. like 70 or 80% of what we do. And so it's just, I mean, at first it can feel difficult, but if you just do one habit at a time, and then mm -hmm. after several weeks, it becomes your autopilot and then you're ready yep. to add on another one. And then you just eventually become this new person. And another great book, I think it's called Embodiment. Mm. Um, and you can literally, because some people, you know, because we talked about being busy and the way that life is and people's lifestyles now, you have to, you have to kind of make that time and be intentional about being quiet to be able to tune yep. in your body. Mm -hmm. And this book that talks about like asking your body what it needs. So yep. you're saying, you know, like brush your hair or um, take a nap or read a book or whatever they are. Like if you don't know, if, if someone is out of touch with their body that much, it will tell you um, if yep. you just ask it, you know, do, do you want this right now? Or what do you need right now? And something will come through and you'll know. Right. And I think it's important too, that people know that they're not robots and they can't run at a hundred percent all the time. Yeah. And so it's okay to have off days. It's okay to give yourself grace. Like I walk six days a week, generally, when I first started doing it, I walked 30 days straight just to get into that habit every single day because I was recovering from burnout myself and mm -hmm. I needed something that wasn't going to stress my adrenals that I could do, but it was active. And so it's just stuck with me. And now are there days that I'm like, you know what, today is just not the day I'm doing that. Like I, my body needs to rest. And as much as my mentally like wants to stay in that routine, my mm -hmm. body's telling me otherwise. Yeah. And I, it's hard for me some days to be like, it's okay to rest, mm -hmm. but I do. And I honor my body in that way. And the other thing too, is our brains get tired. You're literally burning chemicals while you're thinking all day long working. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not eating foods or having a healthy diet that you can sustain those things, it's going to show up in poor performance. And yeah. so if you're struggling with your performance, struggling with focus, struggling with concentration, look at your diet because that has a huge impact of that. Mm -hmm. And if you do need a brain break, like there'll be days I'll be sitting here working and working and working. And I'm just like, and I hit a wall and yeah. I'm going to go lay on the bed and listen to some music and just zone out for a half hour and close my eyes. And I come back and I'm refreshed again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like the, the siesta, right? Like over, you know, in Europe and things like that, they get the afternoon, you know, take a nap, take some time for yourself. If that's on your lunch break, go sit in your car and have a siesta if you need to do what mm -hmm. you need to do to make sure you can fill that back up too. And just take a breath because you're not a machine. Yes. Yes. And I feel like this is how people end up with, you know, things like MTHFR because they, they gradually ignore these signs and these signals. So I think it's, yeah. I don't know if you agree, but it's kind of getting back to that, our center and listening. Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, is like your genes can be turned on and off based on your lifestyle and your diet. So if you are overly stressed and you are not taking care of yourself and prioritizing that self-care, then that's going to make those genes turn on that we don't want on and turn off the ones that we do want on. So that is such a huge factor of, you know, having that balance and tuning into your body and taking care of it because it is the only one you got and none of us are getting out alive. Yeah. Oh, so well said. Um, is there, I have one more question for you. Before I ask it, is there anything else that you would like to share? I think mostly it's just important that people know that genetics plays such a huge factor in their overall health. And, you know, when I work with clients and I'll show them their results, um, they get emotional because they have that validation for the first time a lot of times 
that they've never gotten from doctors because doctors have gaslit them or met other medical professionals and said, you know, you're, it's all in your head. It's fine. This is just how things are. You know, everybody goes through this. And that doesn't give you any justification. It just kind of makes you feel worse. <laughs> so mm. when they get those results back, it's that that sense of like peace. And I made sure that I got my certified, um, my certificate for trauma-informed coaching because I knew this was going to be a heavy spot for a lot of people just to lay that and let it be. And um, I'll share real quick with my my sister, for example. So she's my half sister and mm. her dad um, is 50 years old and has about 10% heart function right now. and so to not be very old and to have that kind of an issue with his ticker going on, um, you know, it's a concern. And she's yeah. 27, has had three knee surgeries, has PCOS, all sorts of other things. And I was like, sister, you need to get this done. And so she did. And she also has had this experience of, like she said, it feels like her brain's on fire. And no one could really understand what she was trying to say. She was like, like my arm's so numb, I can't talk. Like, it's just, I don't know what it is. And doctors were like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it, you're having a seizure. She's like, I'm not having a seizure. It's like, it's just literally right here in my brain. It feels like it's on fire. So they're trying to give her anti-convulsants and these types of things. Well, after we got her results back, the first thing that showed up for her was bone health. And I was like, well, sister, that's no surprise after three knee surgeries and a donor patella and donor ligament. Like we know that that's an issue for you. Right. The second thing was, is we figured out that what that was going on is she's burning chemicals in her brain too quickly, specifically taurine, I believe it was, and it's causing excess ammonia to build up in her brain. Wow. And so that's like exhaust fumes in her brain causing wow. that sensation for her. And so I was like, you gotta, if you're stressed, like, cause that's when she gets it. Like when she's high stressed and like overwhelmed and she can kind of feel it start to come on. And so now she's changing her diet. She's making sure that if she's stressed, she goes and grounds herself. She will literally go sit on the ground for a few minutes and just like work through it. And then it passes. And so having that awareness, she bawled. She was so emotional. She was like, oh my God, for the first time, I don't feel crazy. And I get that a lot from clients, not just my sister, but a lot of clients They just bust out like, oh my God, I've been searching for this for years. And everyone told me there was nothing wrong with me. And it was normal. Mm. no it's not <laughs> so that's if anything I just want people to know you're not crazy your body's trying to tell you something and listen to those whispers because they can turn into screams yes yes to everything I I, I lied I have two more questions Is oh, there, okay bring it on <laughs> where can people find you so you can find me on TikTok and on Instagram with at MTHFR underscore coach. Um, my website revitalizing underscore or hyphen wellness um, is just a very generic place that you could go learn some information. I do have a small community that you could check out as well. Um, otherwise, you can just email me at MTHFR coach at revitalizing hyphen wellness.com. And I'll have all of that in the description, of course. And my final question for you is, what is your number one health tip, whether it's mindset, diet, and nutrition, physical, emotional, just the one piece of advice you would like everyone to know? I think other than food, because obviously that's a given, is making sure that you're working with your nervous system. And a part of my program, I have pieced out to specifically address that. Because again, you could be doing literally everything right, eating the right food, having the right mindset, making sure you're you know, not doing the toxin thing. But if your nervous system is still in fight or flight, none of that's really going to matter. Yeah. It's not going to stick. It's not going to absorb the right way. So I made sure to like partner with other practitioners that are also certified in trauma and things like that. So that way they give you different modalities of like, here's some yoga and how this affects you. Or, hey, here is some sound therapy. And this is how your vagus nerve is affected with actually MTHFR and B12 and those types of things. So it's really cool to have those pieces come together so people can understand the whole picture and not just part of the picture of, oh, I just need to eat different. It's more than that. It's everything. Mm -hmm. This has been so great, Rhiannon. Rhiannon? Yes. This has been so great, Rhiannon. Thank you so much for coming on. And for everyone listening, make sure to check out the show notes where to find more from her and have a beautiful day. Thanks, Jessica. It's been an honor. That concludes this episode. If this resonated with you, please give it a rating and review. And if you have any questions, 
please feel free to reach out on Instagram. I would love to hear from you. Links are in the show notes. I sincerely thank you for your time and your presence.